Coming up on today's Airborne, the first flight of Bombardier's Learjet 85. The FAA grounds non-commercial search and rescue UAV flights. And the aviation medical community opposes the third class medical changes. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. The Learjet 85 aircraft has successfully completed its first flight. That marks the start of the aircraft's flight test program leading up to the first customer delivery. The flight departed from Wichita Mid-Continent International Airport and lasted approximately 2 hours and 15 minutes. It reached an altitude of 30,000 feet and an airspeed of 250 knots. All flight controls were exercised with the systems and aircraft performing as expected. Bombardier employees, along with suppliers, were on hand at the Bombardier Wichita facility to celebrate this milestone flight and greet the Learjet 85 aircraft and test flight crew upon landing. Once again, the FAA has gone after drone flying, as if they actually had regulations to control it. Only last month, an NTSB judge ruled that the FAA did not have control over drone flights because they have not gone through a regulatory process to control them. It's been reported that a group in Texas that voluntarily searches for missing persons through the use of UAVs in a non-commercial operation is being told by the FAA that they need approval to do so. The group, known as Texas EcuSearch Mounted Search and Recovery Team, voluntarily helps local authorities search for missing persons with the aid of a UAV mounted television camera. It seems beyond reason that the FAA continues with their approach of regulating UAV operation without addressing it through the standard regulatory process. You're watching Airborne. We'll be back after these messages with more news and our feature of the day. ADSB will be mandatory for most aircraft by 2020 in the United States. But you can benefit from ADSB today with the Bendix King KT-74 Mode S Transponder. The KT-74 meets the global mandates for ADSB out when attached to a suitable WASP GPS. Rebuilding the sport aviation world one aviator at a time. That's ANN's new Aerosports ebook series, your resource guide to the ultimate in aviation adventures. Aerosport will feature the straight skinny on learning and enjoying 16 unique aviation sports, from ultralights and ballooning to aerobatics, gyroplanes and hang gliders to parachuting, home builds and general aviation to RC models. All this and more will be coming soon with the new updatable Aerosport guide for your favorite electronic devices. Get your advance order in now at www. Welcome back. If you'd like to support Airborne Aero TV, our website, or our podcast, drop an email to jim at aero-news.net. The Civil Aviation Medical Association, representing doctors who perform FAA medical exams, are pushing back against proposed legislation that would do away with a requirement for a third-class medical certificate for some pilot. In an email sent to congressional members by CAMA President Dr. Mark Eidson, he says that the elimination of the third class medical certificate would have an adverse effect on aviation safety. Dr. Eidson wrote in part, quote, we wish to state our strong opposition to HR 3708 and S2103, which we believe will seriously threaten the safety of affected pilots their passengers, and the public below, end quote. In the email, he also stated, quote, being mindful of challenges to general aviation, a CAMA task force for medical certification has proposed expanded recreational pilot privileges that would allow operation of larger aircraft at greater speeds with relaxed, simplified medical requirements. The key difference will be preservation of medical oversight by AMEs. End quote. It's Friday at last, and that means it's time for ANN's editor in chief, Jim Campbell's weekly barnstorming commentary. This week, Jim's going to talk about lessons learned from ANN's return to the Sun and Fun event at Lakeland this year. Here's this week's barnstorming. 
Thanks, Ashley. Hi, folks. Well, last week was kind of interesting. For the first time in a number of years, I attended the Lakeland Flying, so-called Sun and Fun. Uh, for those of you who are aware of the history, uh, we hadn't gone for a number of years because Sun and Fun took exception to stories that we had done, outlining a number of safety issues, safety issues that were very serious to us, and safety issues that were ultimately proven right because within days of our exposing those safety issues, accidents, even deaths, resulted. And over the years, they decided to make me persona non grata and create all kinds of problems. But the ultimate fact of the matter was this. We were right. And whether we were right or wrong or indifferent, the fact of the matter also is that we have a constitution that protects journalists, that protects our responsibilities as well as our rights. And one of our responsibilities is to tell you the truth as we know it, to be careful about the facts, but to tell you, hopefully, free of restriction. Well, we told you, but we dealt with the restrictions as well. Well, with the old guard at Sun and Fun gone, the new guard seemed to ignore that, and that's all well and good. Although nobody said a word about regretting what's happened in the past or even apologizing for what's occurred. And well, we're putting our big boy pants on and just kind of going, okay, well, we still got a job to do and we'll do it. But the big question is, is this event viable in today's scheme of things? And it's a really big question. The first half of the fly-in seemed to go rather poorly. There were, weren't a whole lot of people there. There's a lot of disorganization. The site plan is a bit of a mess. The volunteers have indicated that there were significant problems in getting instructions and getting cohesive leadership. So it's hard to say what's going to happen. Outside of that, though, when the Blue Angels showed up, there were a number more in attendance. And hopefully that's a good thing, although it's certainly not the kind of attendance that the vendors hope for. And by and large, 99% of the vendors, uh, practically 100%, basically said that things weren't going well, that they hadn't been going well for years. And many were talking about either withdrawing or curtailing activity for the future. So this is a fly-in that needs to be fixed. But on the other side, I have a message for the vendors. Too many of you still don't know what you're doing. Too many of you don't know how to market. Too many of you don't know how to deal with the public. Too many of you poorly prepared for the people that did show up. There's enough on both sides of this that if both sides put together a concerted effort, better things may result. But until both sides of this industry, the vendors, the people who put on the fly-ins and everybody concerned start acting more professionally, do a bit of more planning and think more about who it is they're attracting and how to serve them, well, we're not quite sure the event is going to make it. At the same time, nobody wants to see anybody in aviation fail. For those of you who did go to Lakeland, tell me what you think. I'd like to hear more from you. I've gotten a lot of good input, but I'd like to hear more. In the meantime, we look forward to getting more data, and we'll let you know what comes up. For the Aero News Network, Airborne and Aero TV, I'm Jim Campbell. It's good to see an old friend return. Sun and Fun marked the first public event for Mooney International, which officially kicked off their comeback to the aviation industry. The Ovation 3 will also be reintroduced this year, featuring a 310 horsepower Continental Gold Standard IO550 engine, producing a 197 knot cruise speed. With the focus on quality and lean production processes and systems, Mooney is gradually ramping up production. Six airplanes are scheduled for completion in 2014. Production will then increase substantially in 2015. To celebrate the occasion, CEO Dr. Jerry Chen announced the launch for an industry-first online charity auction to purchase the first new production Mooney since the company entered its five-year hiatus. All proceeds from the auction will be used for the future Mooney Historical Museum, a new nonprofit corporation initiative for the company. The online auction for the first Acclaim Type S can be accessed immediately from the newly designed Mooney website. You're watching Airborne. We'll be back with more news after these messages. Since its inception, Redbird Flight Simulations has been dedicated to developing new training technologies and processes in an ongoing effort to make aviation safer, more affordable, and more accessible. Consider Redbird's flagship flight training device, the FMX, a superior quality, full motion, feature-rich advanced aviation training device priced with real-world flight training organizations in mind. With standard features that are anything but standard, such as wraparound visuals, a fully enclosed cockpit, 
quick change configurations, scenario-based training compatibility, and of course, an electric motion platform, the FMX serves up a level of realism that is simply unavailable in other training devices on the market. For more information on Redbird flight simulations, the Redbird FMX, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. Here's some advice. If you don't like airplanes, don't buy a house on an airport. Situated in the village of Wellington, Florida, is a home and airport development known as the Aero Club. The homes surround a 4,000-foot paved runway that sits in the middle of the development. Now, according to reports, relationships between the village of Wellington and the Aero Club have become a little tense since a village councilman bought a house there. He started proceedings in the village council to regulate the operation of the airport. Kim Kopp, a resident of the Aero Club, is reported to have said, quote, this is initiated by one councilman because he's moving in and doesn't like airplane noise. It seems like common sense would dictate that if you don't like airports, don't buy a house near an airport. But then of course, what's common sense got to do with this situation? The airplane that its creators hope will fly around the world using no fuel has been introduced to the world. Tom Patton reports. Solar Impulse 2 boasts a wingspan broader than most airliners, yet has only a single seat and weighs just 5,000 pounds. The airplane was created by Bertrand Picard and André Borschberg, who hope to take turns flying the airplane around the world sometime next year. Like its predecessor, Solar Impulse 2 derives all of its fuel from solar panels that charge batteries driving four electric motors, allowing the airplane to stay aloft at night using no traditional fuel. To complete the around-the-world flight, Solar Impulse 2 will have to accomplish what no other aircraft has achieved before, flying without fuel with only one pilot for five consecutive days and nights over oceans and from one continent to another. Flight testing for Solar Impulse 2 is set to begin next month, followed by training flights over Switzerland. The solar-powered circumnavigation is planned for 2015, but no firm departure date has been set. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. Get comprehensive real-time 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. Please remember Airborne is streamed three times a week and is always online. Join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for a new edition of Airborne. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.